Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome back to Feeding Knowledge Project. Today we are here to um, for the second cycle of webinar. Uh, today we will get um, uh, the second webinar for the second priority, which we entitled Quantitative Assessment of Biotic Constraints to Crop Productivity. Let me uh, give you um, an idea today about the, uh, the project activity and what we are uh, uh, mean by feeding knowledge. We have now a small video, a very short video, which we will speak, will explain you about the, the project. But before that, I want just to tell you that feeding knowledge program is, a, is an initiative from Milano Expo 2015, where we have uh, Mediterranean Agronomic Institute from Siam organization, and together with Politecnico of Milano, the, the collaboration to start to feeding knowledge program. Feeding knowledge program is important, which initiative from Milano, which we aim at the end to feed the planet. Let's uh, uh, have the video now with some um, uh, short break to hear what is uh, feeding knowledge program in in short terms, then well, I, I give you more details about the, uh, the project. Today, food security is still a promise. Knowledge is the way to make it real. Feeding Knowledge will establish an international scientific network for research and innovation, supported by an international technology platform. The network will promote the transfer of knowledge on food security and support policies and programs that really meet the needs of developing countries. In order to build the basis of the Expo Milano 2015 legacy, Feeding Knowledge supports the recognition and dissemination of best sustainable development practices on food security. Feeding Knowledge, International Network for Research and Innovation on Food Security. So I'm sorry for if we didn't hear all of the video because maybe something go on streaming. The video is, uh, takes time to be downloaded for all. I know that mm -hmm. many users are following the presentation. This is why we are not able to see all of the video. Anyway, you can see the same video by YouTube. It's already present in the net. It's just searching for feeding knowledge, and you can find it also our new platform. Let me go back to our uh, project. I will tell you that we we decide to use this kind of Three, as you can see in this term, about the project uh, symbol. Um, this is why uh, the idea start start from, from the roots of the tree. The roots of the tree are the main idea uh, focused on the knowledge development. It's the best way to identify concrete solution for food security that really meet the need of countries. The main objective is creating opportunities for dialogue and development through a Mediterranean network of experts focused on research, innovation, and the transfer of knowledge for food security. This project has five priorities. The first one is sustainable of natural resource management. The second one is the quantitative and quality enhancement of crop production, which our priority today, which we get a webinar later. Social, social economic dynamics is, uh, and the global market is the third priority. Fourth one is sustainable development of small rural communities in marginal area. The fifth one is Mediterranean food consumption patterns, diet, environment, society, economy, and health. So the main expected result of this project is the first one, the Euro Mediterranean Scientific Network. For on research and innovation for food security. The second one is the international technology platform feeding knowledge, which I will explain later in details about what kind of platform and how we are able to enter and to register inside. Anyway, you are invited all to register there and you are welcome 
as a kind of um, scientific community. The third objective is the creating of 12 national advisor services to support knowledge development in the local level. So the result of this project will, will try to make as much as the divulgation in the uh, partner countries. The first point is support of national extension services to transfer research results and list of stockholders' needs. The fifth um, uh, result, the expected result, as, as I said before, is support of policy makers to elaborate uh, the, um, for the elaboration and effective politics or, or research and innovation for food security. Mm, let me see you here in the, the target area. As you can see, this is um, focused on the Mediterranean countries. Uh, as you can see, are the main countries um, involved in this project. Going uh, ahead, the first step in the beginning of the activity, we start doing webinars. The first cycle of webinars was already concluded and we, it was easy to do the uh, registration and to follow our webinars. You need just a computer, internet, and connection, speakers, and headphones. The first cycle of webinars, I said, is already concluded. Uh, we, we did one um, webinar for each variety and focusing on um, the main important problem in each, each webinar uh, were done by the, the, the local uh, supervisor of the, uh, the variety. The second cycle just started in at uh, March 28th. We get the first webinar on the variety one and sustainable natural resource management. The title uh, entitled was the, the international treaty on plant genetic resource for food and agriculture. The speaker was Dr. Mario Marino and the colleague Jenny Calabrese. The second one, the second webinar is today, the 9th of April 2013, and we have uh, the, the second variety where we have uh, here with us Professor Richard Strange from uh, from University of London, uh, which we will speak, um, will I explain later about the variety. Uh, um, the title of this uh, webinar is a quantitative assessment of biotic uh, constraints to crop productivity. So um, I will give you just a brief outline of this, of this um, uh, uh, webinar. Just the webinar will focus on crop productivity. It uh, is affected by incidence of pathogens and pests, measure, measurement of disease, pressure, and pathogen measurement of symptoms, measurement of fuels and the quality, establishing the relationship between disease and the health. Um, I want to say now we come um, to Professor Richard, to Professor Strange from uh, Brickbeck College, University of London. Professor, um, Professor Strange is ed the editor-in-chief of Food Security, uh, the Science and Soci Sociology and economics of food production and access to food. Uh, a journal he uh, co-founded with Peter Scott in 2009, uh, one from the most important journals nowadays. He was attracted to plant pathology, and he is the, uh, uh, he, he released to, to food security, and a subject of which has published over than 100 papers. Uh, Professor Strange also published two books. The first one is Bland Disease Control Towards Environmentally Accepted, Acceptable Methods. The second uh, book in, in Bland Pathology Introduction. Uh, currently, he is holding the Honorary Chair of University um, College of London and Honorary Fellowship of Brickback College, University of London. He has been involved in numerous overseas projects, several of which were located in different African countries. He has also supervised many PhD students from these countries, developing world topics directly connected to bland disease problems affecting their food, their food security. Welcome, Professor Strange, and we, we are very pleased to have you here as, as uh, the, uh, our host today. And we are, I will leave the floor to you to, to present um, uh, this webinar. The floor is you. You are welcome. Well, Tia, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Um, as Tia said, uh, I'm going to talk about quantitative assessment of biotic constraints to crop productivity. 
Right, so um, I thought that I would con construct the talk uh, on the basis of these uh, three uh, aspects. First of all, let's define the problem. Secondly, uh, if you want to actually try and do something about the problem, you really have to measure it. Um, so measuring the problem is the second part. And then finally, steps towards solving the problem. So what are the biotic constraints to crop productivity? Uh, well, there are an awful lot of organisms that will attack plants. It's a, a sensible thing for them to do because uh, plants are the primary producers. They photosynthesize and there is your food source if you're able to parasitize the plant. So first of all, plants themselves uh, can be parasitic. Uh, then there are a whole range of other organisms. There are fungi, the nematodes, algae, uromycetes. These are uh, uh, a group that's been recognized relatively recently. Um, one of its uh, most important members uh, uh, is the uh, uh, comes from the genus Phytophthora, means plant destroyer. Phytophthora infestans is the cause of uh, lake blight of potatoes and was responsible for the appalling uh, Irish potato famine. Plasmodiophora mycetes, uh, these are uh, organisms, protozoa, uh, as are trypanosomatids. Then we have the bacteria, phytoplasmas, viruses, and viroids, which are just really a, a few uh, uh, nucleotides in length, relatively few. And finally, insects. I'm not going to say much about insects because primarily I'm a plant pathologist. So here is a, uh, a parasitic plant. It looks extremely beautiful, Striga bionode labiata, but in fact it does uh, a great damage uh, to plants. Um, particularly uh, plants such as sorghum uh, and uh, maize. And the problem is that it attaches, I can get my arrow to it, which is proving very difficult. Oh, here we are. Um, oh, I don't think the, the arrow works today. Um, the, uh, uh, what I wanted to show you is that uh, Oh, there we are. Thank you very much. Um, here is Striga, which is attached to the, the root of this maize plant. Um, and we go on a bit further. These are the attachments. This is in fact due to sorghum. Um, and we have a uh, tubercle here attaching uh, here as another one. Thank you. Um, and uh, the, um, the common name for the disease caused is, uh, or the common name of the parasite is witch weed. It's called witch weed because uh, when you get several of these tubercles attaching to the plant, then uh, the plant dies, and people thought the plant has been bewitched, so it was called witch weed. Then we're coming on to fungi, Paxina graminis. Uh, that is uh, a very serious problem in, in cereals. So, uh, this one is particularly of, of wheat, um, hence the um, specific name. Uh, here we are, uh, triticae affecting wheat. Um, and here's a close up uh, showing so called Eurydosaurus, this is where Eurydosaurus are uh, uh, produced. And you can see there are many, many of them. Uh, billions of spores are produced. And they're airborne, so they can uh, travel long distances. Uh, the, um, uh, it's a particular um, worry at the moment because of uh, um, Vaccinia graminis trilisi, uh, a variant which is called UG99. In fact, since it was discovered, it's now uh, realized that UG99 is not uh, a single genotype. There's a lineage of UG99. 
It was called UG on account of the fact that uh, it was discovered in uh, Uganda. And uh, here, yeah, oops. And uh, the, um, the worry is that it's going to get into this uh, uh, area of, um, uh, of the sub Indian subcontinent, which is, grows a lot of wheat. Few varieties of which have genes uh, which are effective, the effective resistance against UG99. Then we come on to the nematodes. Uh, this is potato cyst nematode, and as its name implies, it, it does cause cysts on the roots of plants. So here are some nematode cysts. And algae, too, can cause leaf spot diseases. This is, uh, I think, on Tahiti lime. And then we come on to the uomycetes, and here is potato blight caused by Phytophthora infestans, probably costing the, the globe around about $7 billion a year. Here's a very susceptible plant, here is one which is more resistant. Um, but uh, to try and maintain some form of resistance against uh, Phytophthora is very difficult. Uh, and a lot of the time, uh, people rely upon chemical control. This is club root caused by Plasmodiophora brassicae. Uh, this is uh, problematic in uh, uh, wherever you, you grow uh, brassicas uh, and these, these spores can stay in the soil for a long time uh, and remain viable. Then we have phyto, uh, um, phytoplasmas, which can cause disease. Marketes disease of palm is a very serious problem. Can kill palms relatively quickly. Um, and then we come on to bacteria. Uh, crown gall uh, is a disease caused by Agrobacterium tuberculosis, and uh, uh, it, it was discovered initially by Cavara in Italy that uh, the causal organism was Agrobacterium, uh, and so there was a bacterial etiology. Uh, the, um, uh, it then presented a conundrum to scientists because quite a lot of uh, this tissue was found to be sterile, it didn't actually contain the bacterium. So people started thinking what was the, uh, the tumor inducing principle, or TIP for short. Well, uh, in fact, Agrobacterium is a genetic engineer, and it transforms plants without permission. Uh, no regulation is going to get in the way of, of a tumor passions if it's uh, in the company of a separate plant transferring DNA. It's not the DNA from its, uh, its um, um, own uh, DNA, it's, uh, the majority of the DNA, it's uh, transferred from a plasmid, the so-called TI plasmid. And what happens is, under the influence of uh, biochemicals from the plant, it actually elaborates its own little hypodermic syringe through which it injects uh, the genes. In the case of uh, the native uh, Agrobacterium tumor pacients, then uh, these genes contain uh, the, um, these genes are code for uh, the production of indolacetic acid and, and cytokines, two hormones which cause the tumor. Um, so this is now, in fact, a, a, ve a vector of choice for transforming uh, plants uh, with useful genes rather than these ones which just cause tumors. Uh, then we have a phytoplasma disease, uh, coconut leaf, leaf or yellow disease. Uh, this, I think, is taken in Ghana, uh, where you can see that the coconut industry has actually been virtually uh, killed off by this phytoplasma. Uh, and then we come to the viruses. African cassava mosaic virus is a serious problem on the African continent because uh, many uh, people are dependent upon cassava. In fact, over the world as a whole, and about uh, 500 million people depend upon cassava as a major source of, of uh, carbohydrate. 
And finally, the potato spindle diorite, which is, is caused by uh, um, a very, oops, uh, caused by uh, this, this uh, very small, um, yes, I forget, this uh, very small amount of RNA. Um, so uh, it's amazing how much damage this, this small segment of RNA can actually cause. Okay, so those are the uh, uh, the um, those are the problems uh, which people who want to grow plants and uh, uh, and we do want to do that because this is what we depend upon for our food. Uh, this is what we're up against. So let's see how we can measure uh, this particular problem. Oh, one more, uh, which I almost forgot. Uh, this is the um, uh, um, white fly. Uh, white flies are of course are, are insects and uh, they um, uh, they are not only a problem uh, themselves, but they are uh, important in virus transmission. So, uh, how do we measure disease? Well, measuring disease pressure is one way of looking at the problem. Uh, and we've got, of course, the soil to think about, and we've got the air to think about. Uh, in fact, uh, what can we do about measuring disease pressure in the soil? Well, one thing to do is to compare uh, your test soil with soil, the same soil that has been sterilized. Uh, the thing is that, uh, of course, uh, the sterilizing technique is not exclusive to the pathogen. What you really want is the complete soil, but just minus a particular pathogen you're interested in. Um, sterilization will affect possibly um, uh, beneficial organisms. Um, then, uh, 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 one way of looking at this is actually to uh, dilute your uh, soil with uh, sterilized soil until you get to an end point where your diluted soil uh, no longer um, actually causes disease. So you get some idea then of the disease pressure. Um, then uh, the um, so that that's a way, in fact, of um, of establishing um, the inoculum potential of the soil. Um, then, of course, if you know what the pathogen is, uh, you can actually measure the, the pathogen uh, from the soil. But that presupposes that you actually know what it is. Well, you can establish the, uh, uh, what, the, what the pathogen is by using Cox postulates, um, which I won't go into now, but people can ask afterwards if they wish. Um, and then you try and establish the relationship between the inoculum potential of the pathogen and the disease severity. What about measuring the uh, pathogen uh, in the air? Well, the, this is called a Hearst spore trap. And you can see it has a vein which uh, um, uh, allows this part here to circulate according to the direction of the wind. Now, in the next slide, there's a couple of diagrams which give you a bit more of an idea. Uh, this is the sort of impact unit. Here's the vein which uh, uh, rotates according to the wind, and this whole part of the echo is here. Now, actually, uh, in this apparatus, there is an inlet through which air can pass and is actually drawn by a vacuum pump. And anything that is in the air impacts on a slide here, which has got sticky tape on it. And this sticky tape uh, uh, collects the organisms, but uh, it rotates because there's a clock there. Uh, it rotates on this on this on this drum. Uh, and you can then uh, take the, the sticky tape off and look at it under the microscope, and indeed you can culture uh, the organisms that have been uh, deposited there. Uh, this is just some data from a uh, small trap. Uh, here's a total culturable uh, number of uh, propagules, um, and the open circles are specifically Cladosporum, which has uh, spores which are. Uh, are um, fairly easily recognizable. Um, 
Then what about the population or, or the amount of pathogen in the plant? Well, the question of the, the amount in the plant, uh, you can actually do this for fungi by, by using chitin analysis. Uh, there is a, a chemical technique which um, depolarizes chitin, so you get a, a series of uh, monomers or polymers of uh, glucosamine. And this can be measured uh, with a, a dye which has got a long name, MBTH for short. Uh, so you can measure this photometrically. Um, antigen detection, so uh, enzyme linked immunosorbent assay uh, can be used. And probably uh, more popular these days is quantitative PCR, polymerase chain reaction. If you know a specific part of the DNA of your organism, you can then uh, PCR it up and uh, get a measure of how much of the organism is there. Measurement of symptoms. Now, this is hard. Um, the thing is, symptoms can come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. You can get a shoot blight, or you can just get a leaf blight, or maybe the fruit is spotted, or maybe the fruit is rotting altogether. Um, on the stem, you can get a canker. Um, on leaves, you can get spots, or you can get wilt. And in the stem, again, you can get a vascular wilt which travels up the stem. Um, and here we come across the disease we've already seen, uh, crown gall. And then, of course, you get a number of root diseases. So how do you get a measure? How can you put a number on that or any of those, those symptoms? Well, it's not easy. Um, this is an example of bisectonia on potato, and this is one of the easier ones to actually uh, score, because what one actually has to do uh, is to make a key which you can look at at the same time as you look at your samples. So this is a, a key for the development of, of uh, bisectonia, and you can see that this is um, not much infected. This is more infected. It's given a score of 5. This one more so of 10. This one, 15. And so by holding this key up uh, at, by the side of the potato you're trying to score, you can get a measure. Um, it's, uh, that is an easy example to use. Uh, we had the, uh, a problem to deal with, which was ascochytoblite, a chickpea. And we were trying to get a, 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 a quantitative method of doing it, um, and uh, a photographic method. And we found in the end, really, we just could not do that. We had to rely upon this business of scoring uh, the, the amount of disease. Um, so we would have a, uh, have a series of about 60 photographs. And we assigned them to uh, different scores, from one to nine. Uh, one is a dead plant, nine is, a, a, is one which is, is pretty healthy, or maybe it's the other way around. Um, you can differ as to which way they, they score. Um, and it's all right, uh, you can score whether a plant is healthy, or you can score whether it's diseased um, uh, and, and dead. Um, but it's in the middle, it becomes very difficult, um, and people can vary. Measurement of yields, uh, if you take cereals, this is uh, um, not usually a problem. Um, you can uh, talk about tons per hectare. Uh, you can talk about the thousand grain weight, the number of spikelets uh, per tiller, and the number of tillers per plant. Um, but the measurement of quality is more difficult, it's subjective. Also, uh, there's the problem that uh, the, um, uh, the consumer, although may be giving lip service to diversity, when it comes to buying his tomatoes or whatever in the supermarket, they look for uniformity. Um, and uh, the, um, this demand has uh, a disproportionate effect on price. You may have uh, material which is really perfectly good from a nutritional point of view, but it is not accepted by the consumer. Um, so uh, the farmer gets a very poor price for it. 
So can we establish some sort of relationship between um, uh, uh, disease and yield? Well, uh, one way of doing it is, in the case of some diseases, there is a critical point uh, where you can measure the disease uh, and then say, well, you can predict that what the loss will be. So this is uh, measured by, uh, the loss is measured by uh, the, um, the proportion of disease in a particular growth stage and uh, multiplied by a coefficient. And that is determined by the nature of disease and the crop. But then you can use uh, multiple point models. That is, you go and take the disease reading at different at, at different times. So here we've got these uh, taking the time north time uh, two two days after infection uh, and uh, five days and uh, and six days, um, and you measure the area under this curve so-called area under the disease progress curve. And uh, if those who are interested, this is the formula for the area under the disease uh, progress curve. Um, I don't think I need to read it out. But XI uh, is a measure of disease severity at the I observation. T is a measure of time, which is usually in days. And N is the total number of observations. So, so much for measuring disease. Um, what about control, which is the solution that we want? Well, genetic control is the preferred uh, um, solution uh, because you give a, the farmer a, a seed of a plant which is resistant. Uh, all he has to do is to uh, culture it in a normal way. He hasn't got to take any particular uh, steps to um, prevent disease occurring. Another technique is biocontrol, and this is um, uh, this is uh, it's very attractive. Um, it, it, um, people perceive it as being natural, but it is difficult to implement effectively, mainly because there are uh, so many variables, um, and it's uh, very difficult to do it on a large scale. Um, then we come to selective biocides. Uh, now, these are effective. They have rather a na bad name. They said, people say these are chemicals. Well, actually, everything is chemical. Um, but uh, they can have unwanted side effects. For example, they may kill beneficial organisms, and they may kill, of course, operators as well. Now, uh, since uh, genetic resistance is really um, uh, very important uh, and uh, highly appropriate as a, a method of disease control, uh, uh, people are interested in, in, in doing it, but there are problems. Um, finding resistance in the gene pool of a crop plant uh, is not easy. Um, and then introgressing this resistance into a crop plant uh, can take uh, anything up to a dozen years uh, before you get it, uh, the uh, uh, the gene into uh, commercial variety. So the long time between discovery of an appropriate resistance gene uh, to its exploitation uh, gives uh, ample opportunity for the pathogen, which of course is not static and can very easily evolve, or can too easily in many cases evolve uh, uh, um, Virulence towards the introgressed gene. So your hard one resistance, uh, resistant variety may not ever make it to the field because already it becomes susceptible to the very disease which you are trying to breed against. Um, you, uh, it's, it, uh, the resistance uh, conferred by resistance genes, of course, is, can be far more effective if you have more than one. Uh, gene makes it much more difficult for the pathogen to evolve uh, resistance to, uh, or rather, to evolve virulence to several genes. Um, but how do you recognize whether you've got uh, more than one gene there? Um, and of course, you need to have resistance to more than one pathogen as a rule. 
So what solutions do we have uh, to the difficulties of obtaining genetic resistance? Well, marker-assisted selection, that is very helpful, uh, um, or can be. Uh, you are able to detect uh, resistance uh, genes in young plants. This can speed up the, uh, the, the breeding program. Uh, and you are able to pyramid genes uh, so that you can have several resistance genes in the same plant. Uh, and finally, one can uh, think in terms of genetic modification. Uh, this last one. Now, let me take you back to our friend Agrobacterium tumor fasciens. As you will recall, uh, this has uh, a plasmid, a TI plasmid, so called, and this transfers the tDNA, transfer DNA, uh, to, uh, to the plant. So you can delete the, the tumorigenic genes and put in really more or less whatever you wish from whatever source. Um, this has got uh, certainly potential. Um, one of the uh, ways in which it, it's been used is uh, in um, pathogen-derived resistance. And what is done here is that uh, one can take, for example, the coat protein gene from a virus and you transform the plant with it. So when the virus itself comes along, he uses his own RNA. There's already a bit of RNA there from the, the uh, transfer gene. Um, and these form a dimer. Uh, this is recognized uh, and uh, is chopped up by an enzyme called DISA. It uses these small interfering RNA uh, subunits. Um, and they form uh, a gene-induced uh, silencing uh, complex risk for short RNA induced science and complex and this uh, uh, targets the virus and cleaves it. This uh, can give a very high uh, amount of resistance um, and this is being exploited currently in trying to get uh, disease uh, resistance to cassava brown street uh, disease. As I said, cassava is a very important uh, uh, crop, uh, especially in the, on the African continent. Um, and this is a reference which you may be interested in. It just came out at the end of last year. So transgenic RNA interference derived field resistance to cassava brown streak disease. You can see these brown streaks in the tubers, um, which of course are not much appreciated by, by the housewife. Um, and then, uh, if you're interested in this uh, business, then uh, a couple of really uh, of books that I suggest you might like to take an interest in. Uh, Jonathan Gressel wrote um, Transgenics for Crop Biodiversity. And but the, the first uh, part of the title is Genetic Glass Ceilings. It's like, uh, it takes us really from uh, uh, women who complain that uh, they can advance so far in a firm, but then they hit a glass ceiling uh, uh, beyond which they cannot uh, get further promotion. But an even more recent uh, book is this one, Successful Agricultural Innovation in Emerging Economies. Uh, so New Genetic Technologies for Global Food Production, and it's edited by uh, David Bennett and Richard Jennings. Uh, there are several chapters, a number of chapters there. Uh, about this subject. But thank you very much for listening, and uh, um, I hope you have some questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Strange. Thank you very much for a very rich presentation, very full of new things, and I, I imagine that you get a, a very uh, nice discussion. I, I imagine I see the many questions was come already in the chat. Um, from everyone, I, I will invite others if, uh, after the presentation finished to ask more questions because the subject is very important and it's an innovative one. And while I will give time to Professor Strange to see that your question and to give time to answer, let me give you um, um, uh, just a small confirmation about the priority two and what we are 
uh, uh, doing to speak uh, in, in the white paper which we are preparing in this variety. Um, so, something like um, uh, an idea what we are uh, trying to produce and um, I, I choose to, to use this kind of presentation in, uh, as an iceberg because it's kind of a lot of work was carried out and um, just a few things was going to emerge from water uh, in this variety but a big staff of experts working under the ground and um, um, I will present uh, uh, all of them but one by one and to show you this white paper stuff working. Let's start from Professor Strange, the international expert in this variety and I already present him and he say that that speech. So, um, I present myself, I am Tayyar Yassin, I am a researcher from plant pathology, I'm specialized in mycology working in, in uh, international uh, organization CM and in, in Italy the, the my uh, seat. Uh, I work in uh, integrated pest management division. Let's, let me present also the, our colleague, the, the first is um, our um, uh, coordinator, the coordinator of integrated pest management division is Anna Maria Dongia, who is supervised all this work. Um, the other colleague is uh, Alessandra uh, Richelli from uh, the researcher in mycotoxins contaminants from, international, from institutes of chemical, uh, biomed, biomolecular chemical in, in CNR in Rome. Uh, um, the third slide here you can see um, the uh, other colleague and experts in, in, in organic farming as uh, our colleague uh, Francesco Celle who is taking care about the aspects with organic farming and the, how to, we can enhance the quality of the product during in, 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 the, in this activity. Um, Franco Santoro is an engineer who is taking care about research, his research in precision crop protection and with what, how we can use the decision support system and innovation technology to get a fast and rapid decision using the informatic systems. As you know, all this innovation and research application is not able to be to be um, rich as a field if we didn't have a good legislation. And this legislation, but um, our colleague Maurizio De Santos is taking care about this um, argument, um, considering the European legislation and how to would be, ex be expand extended in the future for other member country. Um, uh, uh, Dr. DeSantis uh, working from NCM also working in, in Ministry of Agriculture, uh, in Italian Ministry of Agriculture. So, so let me present uh, the, the staff who you didn't see yet, uh, who worked in behind the screen, uh, the group of uh, Milano, Valeria Baudi, Gianfranco Ilia, Paula Corti, Francesca Conica, who gave us big support in, um, to, have, to get success in this project. Our colleague from uh, uh, the Institute of Bari, Laura Civetti, and uh, Marinella Giannelli, he, who we get in touch every day and to, to get the, the sub technical support and organization for all these things. Let's, uh, let me speak about what we carry out in the beginning for how to make this collaboration an e collaboration instrument to, to get in touch with all these experts everywhere. At the beginning, we used Dropbox, a symbol, symbol um, to be installed in any computer, and we can share documents. And we, we use Google Drive to make a, a simultaneous correction with, with one document, and the normal email at the end, who, the classic one who helped us also. Um, the variety one, we decided at the beginning to divide it in different ways. Now we are restructuring also the white paper in this variety. It was divided now in pre-harvest and post-harvest activity. And now in, in, in this activity, we are trying to divide it in um, biotic and abiotic constraints, which affecting the productivity and the quality of products. And also, in, even if in biotic and abiotic constraints will be divided in pre- and post-harvest, we'll take care of more, more um, uh, activity. So, um, let me tell you what is the uh, feeding knowledge platform and how you can contact us and how you can involve, be involved in this, uh, in this project. So, so the, our platform is already launched some three weeks ago and you can, you can um, find it in, uh, in the internet just going to the feeding knowledge uh, point net.
So um, if you go uh, exactly to this side, you are able also to register and you are able also to make your, um, your account. And you are all invited to share us, to share us to and to create your, your um, uh, account. It's so easy, you can just enter uh, in this variety. This is our, uh, our uh, variety, variety two. And just you can enter and get a new account and you can fill, fill this for fill with the, with the, the verification test. Then we we'll be accepted to to join uh, uh, to join the the project. So you are um, you will find inside uh, after registration you will get the username and password and I will show you that you will have the possibility to to join to the forum where the discussion will be. Uh, uh, open time by time with our colleague, and we can get a free discussion. Then we have the different, different document library, different document library where the researchers could could be able also to to um, to share this document with all the scientific community and with all um, researchers. Um, also, we can uh, we can. See in the web conference, we are able also to create such kind of of um, uh, uh, webinar uh, done one by one with some of, uh, of experts uh, to getting uh, direct discussion about that. And anyway, if you if you get problems, there's as you can see here this help chat directly help chat. You can ask. Uh, uh, you can get find um, live assistance from our colleague from Milano. Can uh, you write your name and get the email and have, have uh, 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 write your question, type your question here and get the uh, replay. So uh, now, um, thank you. Again, I want to, uh, to uh, I finish the, the presentation. I will give the, the, the floor again to Professor Strange. I hope that he had enough time to, to uh, read all your questions. I, I'm supposed that you get a lot. Uh, so this is the, the, the question. We can we can find them here and um, uh, the floor is yours again, Professor Strange, yeah. and can relate to the colleague. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, thank you to, to Kai Sassi who asks, are there any models for predicting damage from biotic constraints? Yes, indeed, there are many models. Uh, and if you go to the plant pathology uh, literature, you you will find many. I can't actually quote you a, a reference off the top of my head. I don't have them at hand, but. Uh, uh, yes, indeed, there are, there are many, and uh, um, there is a problem with some of these models because uh, the difficulty is in the weather. Because if you have a hailstorm, for example, then your predictions are likely to be awry. Um, so uh, I hope that is some help to you. But do go and look at the literature, and even just googling, you will find things. So my second question is from Sasa Jerdevic. Uh, is it possible to do, uh, prevent uh, aflatoxins in maize? That's a very important question. Aflatoxins are an extremely serious problem. Um, the uh, thing about aflatoxins, certainly aflatoxin B1, uh, is that it uh, is the ultimate carcinogen, liver carcinogen, the reason being that uh, it, the liver, uh, which has mechanisms of um, detoxifying uh, from uh, compounds, attempts to detoxify uh, the aflatoxin, and in so doing, actually converts it, it, it opens up a double bond and produces an epoxide. And this is the ultimate carcinogen. Uh, the particular problem if uh, you're suffering from hep hepatitis B, because it predisposes you to. to uh, uh, carcinogenesis. Also, uh, in higher doses, aflatoxins uh, are actually poisons. And there's been a fairly recent case in, in Kenya where a number of people have died. Um, now, are there, is it possible to prevent uh, aflatoxin? There is, I understand, uh, a, a current project by uh, the consultant group for international agricultural research uh, who are, are trying to. Um, come to uh, get a, a, some sort of solution. And if I understand it correctly, uh, it's uh, to reduce strains of uh, Aspergillus flavus, uh, which are non-toxigenic and which will out-compete 
uh, the aflatoxin uh, strains. Now, the third question is from Pasco Pandeli. Uh, I think we need to go back one. Um, so he asked, what about um, the assessment of biotic constraints in, in greenhouses? Um, where can we find such data? Well, uh, yes, indeed, um, there, there, there are biotic constraints. For example, um, botrytis can be quite a problem in greenhouses. There was some, going back a, a while, uh, some interesting work was done on um, using uh, um, filters to put uh, on your greenhouse, which will allow photosynthetically active parts of the spectrum to go through into the greenhouse, but would actually uh, prevent those parts of the spectrum which were needed for the sporulation of this fungus. That seems to me a very neat idea for, for uh, um, uh, um, controlling uh, disease in the greenhouse. So where sporulation of a, a fungus depends upon a particular uh, wavelength or a particular combination of wavelengths, if you can screen those out, that, that is a, a great a way of doing so. Nureddin G, excuse me, with my massive Jewish, a future IPM approach and a process to solve agricultural pests. Can we rely upon GMO crops or genetically engineered or modified organisms? Well, big question. Um, uh, I think that um, it's a mistake to think of any one sort of solution to solve agricultural uh, pest problems. Uh, um, for example, if you're actually talking about insect pests, there's the business of push pull, uh, in which you um, uh, grow uh, plants amongst your crop, which uh, perhaps will attract insects, but they actually poisonous to the insect. Uh, there's also um, you can grow border crops, which repel them. Um, so uh, there are all sorts of, of, of uh, um, techniques. Uh, one technique um, uh, of integrated pest management, um, which I was involved with some years ago, uh, concerned um, uh, cantaloupe melons grown in Iran. Um, there they grow the melons uh, on ridges, and through the corresponding uh, furrows, they pass irrigation water. Well, as the uh, disease, which they call green death, um, uh, was caused by a phytophthora, um, uh, the water from the borehole uh, uh, was an excellent way of spreading the zoospores of the uh, rhodomycete from plant to plant. Now, what we found was that uh, the roots of the plant were surprisingly resistant. They were very resistant. It's just the crown of the plant was very susceptible. So the, the uh, um, technique there, which would prevent the disease was to have the irrigation trenches deep enough so that the water never reached the crown. So I think that uh, um, if you're interested more than in an academic way in solving the uh, agricultural problems, you should be open to uh, every possibility, which will uh, include uh, uh, GMOs. Um, uh, um, I think uh, one should look at all, as I say, all possibilities. Um, and you, uh, as a scientist, you should uh, be open to that in, uh, completely initially. And you should not be uh, too concerned about uh, the many people who seem to uh, uh, want to legislate and uh, regulate, etc., etc. Um, they can only actually work on material which is actually known, or that's what they should do. Um, so um, we should uh, shut off a whole area of work just because we fear that uh, um, some legislator, legislation somewhere will uh, prevent its adoption. That might be a, a, only a, a, a temporary measure, uh, like the next. Um, Next question. Um, Hi, Del Bilali. Uh, do I think the GMO crops will be socially and culturally accepted in the near future to solve food security problems? Uh, well, they already are. Um, in the United States, uh, uh, trillions of meals have been eaten. 
which uh, uh, contain genetically modified uh, material. Um, and I think that uh, there is uh, a movement in Europe where there's been a lot of skepticism um, uh, towards uh, uh, acceptance. Uh, I think that there's a fundamental mistake um, in uh, public perception uh, in some cases. And the, the mistake is this. It, it's uh, actually um, confusing the uh, technique uh, with the product. Uh, the question you should be asking is, uh, is a genetically uh, modified plant uh, actually um, solving a problem uh, and um, I mean, it's all, it, it's, it's possible to put in different genes into plants, and some of them are clearly, you would be very antisocial, but uh, some of them can be very beneficial. Uh, the pathogen derived as resistance, which I mentioned, is, is one of these uh, situations. Then, mana, um, for the measurements explained earlier, how uh, about seasonal variation? Um, Yes, as well, uh, the population of pathogen as well as the symptoms are related to the, to the season. Well, indeed, yes, they, they are. Um, uh, how can we consider it? Well, we can certainly study it. Um, and uh, uh, one of the things that can come out of such studies is uh, uh, our altering planting date. Uh, for example, with um, chickpea, um, there is a uh, um, there's interest in planting uh, the crop late so that um, uh, it escapes the cool season when ascochyte of light can cause big problems. Uh, however, you then have a problem that maybe you'll run into a uh, um, very dry, uh, um, uh, high temperatures later in the season and, and perhaps drought, which will then reduce your yield from another factor. So for sure, we should uh, look at seasons and we should look at um, planting dates. Um, so thank you for that question. And Pandemic Pasco, how much is spent for a new biocide and how much for detecting and incorporating a new resistant team? Oh my goodness, I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to those questions. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm afraid you'll have to go and look at the literature uh, and uh, do, do a good literature search. And uh, uh, when, you, when you know the answers, please email me. Thank you very much for Professor Strange. Um, um, we have a big quantity of questions, as you see. So the, for this reason, we will um, invite Professor Strange, who will reply to all your questions by different channels, as you see in, in Twitter and in Feeding Knowledge platform, and also in, in Facebook. So you can also get um, uh, be involved directly with the discussion, and you get answer and you reply also. In, in the chat uh, uh, area where we can create our forum in, in uh, a network uh, from an feeding knowledge platform. Um, let me uh, to thank again Professor Strange for the very enthusiastic um, uh, uh, presentation and the uh, nice discussion. I want just to give a floor to my colleague Hamid Al Bilali who will present um, the, uh, the new uh, the, the next webinar uh, which, which we can uh, held, who will give you more information about that? The, the floor is you, Hamid. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Tariel. Thank you, Professor Strange. We do believe that in order to address food security problem, we have to, of course, address all issues regarding uh, crop production or the production side of the food chain, but we have also to pay enough attention to the consumption side. And the next webinar that will be held by Dr. Sandro Dianini, and that will be, uh, that is entitled uh, Sustainable Diet, the Mediterranean Diet as a case study, will deal with these issues. But Dr. Sandro Dernini is the coordinator of the Forum on Mediterranean Food Cultures and also a consultant at the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. He will try to uh, give us some insights regarding uh, different issues. And basically, he will try to answer different questions regarding the what, the how, and the why. The, as far as what is concerned, what questions are concerned, 
he will try to uh, give us some insight regarding what is the Mediterranean diet, what are sustainable diets, and also since the Mediterranean diet has been recognized in 2010 as an intangible cultural heritage of humanity, he will try to uh, give us some information regarding the huge diversity of food cultures in the Mediterranean. That's regarding the what questions. As far as, as, far as the why uh, questions are concerned, he will, he will try to provide some information regarding why the Mediterranean diet can be considered that as a case study, especially used by international organizations such as the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, in order to study sustainable diets in different social cultural contexts and agroecological zones. And also uh, why the Mediterranean diet is a sustainable diet and what are the main characteristics of the Mediterranean diet that can help us or not to say so. That regarding the why questions. As far as the how questions are concerned, he will try also to provide us with some insights regarding, first of all, how we can make the Mediterranean dietary patterns, the current Mediterranean dietary patterns, more sustainable. And also, and this is the most important part of his speech, and that is related also to the subject matter of Hidden Knowledge Project, is how, by improving the sustainability of diets and food consumption pattern in the Mediterranean, we can also uh, move toward achieving food and nutrition security in the Mediterranean in general and in Eastern and Southern Mediterranean countries in particular. Thank you very much and I, I look forward to seeing all of you on April 18 for the webinar. Meanwhile, I leave again the floor to Taher for final consideration and conclusions. Thank you, Hamid, very much. Thank you for the nice presentation. Thank you for the interesting subject which you are um, already present and the scenery which is described for the next uh, webinar. I'm sure that we will not miss such kind of uh, important argument. Uh, I want to thank you all for the attending the webinar. I want to thank again Professor Spain for his presence here. Thank you again. See you in the next webinar. Uh, thank you all.